Theosis, the True Purpose of Human Life by Archimandrite George, Abbot of the Holy Monastery of St. Gregorios on Mount Athos. Chapter 6 Qualifications for Theosis The Holy Fathers certainly say that within the Church we can attain theosis. But at the same time, they say theosis is a gift from God. It is not something we can attain on our own. Of course, we must desire, struggle, and prepare ourselves so that we are worthy, capable, and receptive enough to accept and guard this great gift from God, since God does not wish to do anything to us without our freedom. But at the same time, theosis is a gift of God. So therefore the Holy Fathers say, on the one hand, that we undergo theosis, and on the other hand, that God acts in theosis. From this we discern certain qualifications that are necessary on the path of man to theosis. These are 1. Humility According to the Holy Fathers, the first necessary qualification is humility. Without blessed humility, Man cannot be put on the right course for theosis, cannot accept the divine grace, and so unite with God. Simply to acknowledge that theosis is the purpose of our life demands humility, because without humility, how will you acknowledge that the purpose of your life is outside yourself, that it is in God? So long as man lives egocentrically, anthropocentrically, autonomously, he places himself at the center and purpose of his own life. He believes that he can be perfected by his own efforts, defined by his own efforts, deified by his own efforts. This is the spirit of contemporary civilization, contemporary philosophy, contemporary politics, to create an even better world, even more just, but to do this autonomously, by oneself to create a world which will have man at its center with no reference to God, with no acknowledgement that God is the source of all good. This is the fault that Adam committed, believing that, with only his own powers, he could become God, could complete himself. The fault of Adam is one that all humanistic creeds make throughout all the ages. They do not consider that communion with God is indispensable for the completion of man. Everything orthodox is theanthropically centered. Its center is the God-man Christ. Everything that is not orthodox has this common denominator. Its center is man, whether it is Protestantism, Papism, Freemasonry, Millenarianism, Jehovah's Witness, Atheism, or whatever else is outside orthodoxy. For us, the center is the God-man Christ. This means it is easy for someone to become a heretic, a millenarianist, Jehovah's Witness, a Mason, or whatever else, but it is difficult to become an Orthodox Christian. To become an Orthodox Christian, you must first accept that the center of the world is not yourself, but Christ. Thus, the beginning of the path towards theosis is humility, i.e., that we acknowledge that the purpose of our life is outside us, that it is with our Father, our Maker and Creator. Humility is needed to see that we are sick, that we are full of weaknesses and passions. Again, to persist on this path, someone who begins the path of theosis must have constant humility, for if he accepts the thought that he manages perfectly well just by using his own powers, then pride enters him. He loses what he has gained and must start again from the beginning. To become humble, to see his weakness, his human sickness, and learn not to rely on himself, in order to find himself continuously on the path of theosis, he needs to depend on the grace of God. Therefore, in the lives of the saints, their great humility impresses us. While they were near God, they shone within the light of God. They were miracle workers, they gave off myrrh, yet at the same time they believed about themselves that they were very lowly, very far from God, that they were the worst of men. 
It was this humility of theirs that made them gods by grace. 2. Asceticism The Holy Fathers also tell us that theosis has stages. It begins from the lowest and progresses to the highest. Once we have humility, in order to become cleansed from the passions, we start our asceticism by applying the holy commandments of Christ, beginning our daily struggle in Christ with repentance and much patience. The Holy Fathers say that within His commandments, God Himself lies hidden. When a Christian observes them out of love and faith in Christ, then he unites with Him. According to the Holy Fathers, this first stage of theosis is also called praxis. This is practical guidance given at the start of the path towards theosis. Naturally, this is not at all easy, because the struggle to uproot the passions from within us is great. Much effort is required, so that gradually our inner wasteland is cleansed from the thorns and stones of the passions, so that it can be cultivated spiritually, and so that the seed of God's Logos may fall and bear fruit. Great and continuous effort towards ourselves is necessary for all this. Therefore the Lord says that the kingdom of God suffers violence, so the violent sees it. Matthew eleven twelve. And again the Holy Fathers teach us, Give blood and receive spirit, i.e., you cannot receive the Holy Spirit if you do not give the blood of your heart to the struggle to cleanse yourself from the passions, in order to repent really and in depth, and in order to acquire the virtues. All the virtues are aspects of the one great virtue, the virtue of love. When a Christian acquires love, he has all the virtues. It is love that expels the prime cause of all the evils and all the passions from the psyche of man. This cause, according to the Holy Fathers, is selfishness. All the evils within us spring from selfishness, which is a diseased love for one's own self. This is the reason why our church has asceticism. Without asceticism, there is no spiritual life, no struggle, and no progress. We obey, fast, keep vigil, labor with prostrations, and stand upright, all so that we may be cleansed of our passions. If the Orthodox Church ceases to be ascetical, it ceases to be Orthodox, because then it ceases to help man rid himself of his passions in order to become gods by grace. The Church Fathers developed a great and profound anthropological teaching on the psyche and the passions of man. According to them, in the psyche you can distinguish intelligent and passable parts. The passable, again, comprises passionate and desiring parts. The intelligent part contains the reasoning powers of the psyche, the thoughts and cognitive powers. The passionate parts are the positive and negative emotions, love and hate. The desiring part contains the good desires of the virtues and the bad desires for pleasure, for enjoyment, avarice, gluttony, the worship of the flesh, and the carnal passions. Unless these three parts of the psyche, the intelligent, the passionate, and the desiring, are cleansed, man cannot receive the grace of God within himself and cannot be deified. The intelligent part is cleansed by watchfulness, which is the continuous guarding of the noose from thoughts, keeping the good thoughts and rejecting the bad. The passionate part, again, is cleansed by love. Finally, the desiring part is cleansed by self-control. All these parts are both cleansed and sanctified by prayer. 3. The Holy Mysteries and Prayer Christ installs himself in the heart of man through the holy mysteries, holy baptism, chrismation, holy confession, and the divine Eucharist. Those Orthodox Christians who are in communion with Christ have God and his grace within them, in their hearts, because they have been baptized, chrismated, have confessed, and have received holy communion. The passions cover divine grace as ashes bury a spark. 
Through asceticism and prayer, the heart is cleansed of the passions, the spark of divine grace is rekindled, and the faithful Christian feels Christ in his heart, the center of his existence. Every prayer of the church helps to cleanse the heart, but the so-called prayer of a single phrase, also known as noetic prayer, or prayer of the heart, is particularly helpful. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. This prayer, which has always been handed down on the holy mountain, has the following advantage. Because it is only one sentence, it helps us to concentrate our noose more easily. Concentrating our noose, we immerse it in our heart, and then pay attention to make sure it is not busy there with other things and ideas, good or bad, that it is busy only with God. The practice in this prayer of the heart, with which God's grace may in time become continuous, is a whole science, a holy art which the saints of our faith describe in detail in their holy writings, and also in a large collection of patristic texts called the Philokalia. This prayer helps and gladdens man, and when the Christian progresses in this prayer, and at the same time his life follows the holy commandments of Christ and his church, then he is worthy to receive the experience of divine grace. He starts to taste the sweetness of communion with God, to know from experience, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, 8. For us Orthodox, God is not an idea, something that we think about, that we discuss or read about, but a person with whom we come into living and personal communion. It is something we live, and somebody from whom we receive experience. Then we see what a great unspeakable and inexpressible joy it is to have Christ within us and to be Orthodox Christians. Within their different concerns and everyday occupations, it helps Christians who are in the world so much to find at least a few minutes of silence to exercise themselves in this prayer. Certainly, when fulfilled with humility and love, all labors and obligations directed to God sanctify us, but prayer is also required. In a quiet room, perhaps after some spiritual reading, or after lighting a small oil lamp in front of the icons and burning incense, as far as possible away from noise and activity, and after other considerations and thoughts have fallen quiet, they should sink their noose into the heart by saying the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. How much peace and strength the psyches draw from the silence of God! How much this strengthens them during the day so that they can keep themselves peaceful without nervous tension and anxiety, but have all their forces united in harmony. Some people in other places seek silence of the psyche by using artificial means that are deluded and demonic as in the so-called Oriental religions. They try to find a certain silence by using external exercises, meditation, etc., to achieve a certain balance of psyche and body. The fault in all these is that, properly speaking, even when man tries to forget the various considerations of the material world, he does not have a dialogue with God, but only a monologue with himself, so that once again he ends up in anthropocentrism, and in this way, he fails. Chapter 7. Experiences of Theosis Experiences of theosis are proportional to the purity of man. The more someone is cleansed from the passions, the higher the experience he will receive from God. He sees God just as it is written. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. When man starts to repent, to confess, and to cry for his sins, he receives the first experiences of God's grace. Such experiences are first of all tears of repentance, which bring inexpressible joy to the psyche, and then the deep peace which follows this. 
For this reason, this morning for our sins is called gladsome morning. As the Lord also said in his Beatitudes, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Afterwards, we proceed to higher stages by divine illumination in which the noose is illumined and sees things, the world, and men with another grace. Then the Christian loves God more, and new and different tears come, higher ones, which are tears of love for God, tears of divine eros. Then he no longer weeps for his sins, because he has the certainty that God has forgiven his sins. These new tears, which bring to the psyche a greater happiness, joy, and peace, are a higher experience of theosis. Afterwards, man acquires dispassion, a life without deceitful passions and sinful weaknesses. Then he is peaceful and undisturbed from every external assault, having been delivered from pride, hatred, spitefulness, and desires of the flesh. This is the second stage of theosis, called theoria, in the course of which man, having already been cleansed from the passions, is illumined by the Holy Spirit, is made luminous on the way to becoming deified. Theoria means vision. Theoria of God means a vision of God. To see God, he must be a deified man. Thus, theoria of God also means theosis. Of course, when he has been thoroughly cleansed and has offered himself entirely to God, then he also receives the greatest experience of divine grace available to men, which, according to the Holy Fathers, is the vision of the uncreated light of God. Those who are very advanced in theosis see this light, very few in each generation. God's saints see it and appear within it, and, Incidentally, this is what the halos in the holy icons show us. For example, in the life of St. Basil the Great, it is said that when St. Basil was praying in his cell, those who were able to see him saw that he himself, and even his cell, were shining within this uncreated light of God, the light of divine grace. In the lives of many of the new martyrs of our faith, we read that, after horrible tortures, when the Turks hung their bodies in the squares of the town to intimidate other Christians, on many nights a light appeared around them. It shone so clearly and brightly that, because in this way the truth of our faith was so brilliantly revealed, the occupiers ordered them taken down so that they would not be ashamed before the Christians, who saw how God glorified his holy martyrs. The grace of theosis preserves the bodies of the saints incorruptible, and these are the holy relics which exude myrrh and work miracles. As St. Gregory Palamas says, the grace of God, having first united with the psyches of the saints, afterwards shrouds their holy bodies and fills these two with grace, not only their bodies, but also their graves, their icons, and their churches. Here is the reason why we venerate and kiss the icons, the holy relics, the graves, and the churches of the saints. Through theosis, all these have something of the grace of God, which the saint had in his psyche because of his union with God. Therefore, in the church, we enjoy the grace of theosis not only with our psyche, but also with our body because as the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in it and shares its struggles with the psyche, the body is surely glorified. The grace springing from the Holy Lord, the God-man Christ, is poured out into our Panagia, into the saints, and it also comes to those of us who are humble. It is certainly worth noting that the experiences of the Christian are not always experiences of theosis and so spiritual. Many people have been deluded by demonic or psychological experiences. In order that there is no danger of delusion and no demonic influence, all of this must be humbly mentioned to the spiritual father, who, illumined by God, will discern whether these experiences are genuine or not, and he will give appropriate direction to the psyche who is confessing. 
Generally, our obedience to the spiritual father is one of the most basic points of our spiritual path. Through it, we acquire an ecclesiastical spirit of discipleship in Christ by which the legitimacy of our exertion is confirmed in order to guide us towards union with God. Within the church, a special domain of theosis in monasticism, where the monks, having been sanctified, receive high experiences of union with God. Many of the monks who experience theosis and sanctification also help the whole church. For, as we Christians believe following the age-long holy tradition of the church, the struggle of the monks has a positive effect on the life of every struggling faithful in the world. In our orthodoxy, the people of God have great reverence for monasticism because of this. After all, in the church we partake in the communion of the saints and experience the joy of union with Christ. By this we mean that within the church we are not isolated members, but a unity, a brotherhood, a fraternal community, not only among ourselves, but also with the saints of God, those who are living on earth today and those who have passed away. Not even at death are Christians divided. Death is unable to separate Christians because they are all united in the resurrected body of Christ. Therefore, every Sunday and every time the Divine Liturgy is celebrated, we are all present in it together with all the angels and all the saints through all the ages. Even our departed relatives are present, if, of course, they are united with Christ. We are all there and communicate among ourselves mystically, not externally, but in Christ. This is evident during the Prothesis where the portions for the Panagia, the saints, and the living and departed Christians are all placed on the holy paten around Christ the Lamb. After the sanctification of the holy oblation, all these portions are immersed in the blood of Christ. This is the great blessing of the Church, that we are her members and, as members of Christ's body, can communicate not only with God but also between ourselves. The head of this body is Christ himself. Life comes from the head to the body. The body certainly has living members, but it also has members which do not have the same vitality. Not all the members have perfect health. This applies to the majority of us. Life comes from Christ himself and his living members. The healthy blood also comes to other less healthy members, so that slowly, slowly, they also become healthy and strong. This is why we must be in the church, in order to receive health and life, because outside the body of the church there is no possibility that we can recover and become enlivened. All of this, of course, does not come about immediately. Throughout the whole of our life, the Orthodox Christian must struggle, so that, slowly, slowly within the church, With the grace of God, with humility, repentance, prayer, and the holy mysteries, he may be sanctified and deified. This, however, is the purpose of our lives, the great aim. It is not so important exactly how far we progress. Our struggle itself, which God blesses abundantly, has value both in the present age and in the age to come. Chapter 8. Failure of Many People to Reach Theosis So, while we have been called to this great purpose, to unite with God, to become gods by grace, and to enjoy this great blessing for which our Maker and Creator made us, we often live as if this great and noble aim does not exist for us. Because of this, our life is filled with failure. Our holy God molded us for theosis, so if we are not deified, our whole life is a failure. Let us mention some of the reasons for this. 1. Attachment to the basic cares of life We may do good and beautiful things. We may study, 
have a profession, raise a family, acquire property, or perform charitable deeds. When we see and use the world eucharistically as a gift from God, then everything joins with Him and becomes a path to union with God. If, even then, we do not unite with God, we have failed, and it has all been useless. People usually fail because they are misled by the various secondary purposes of life. They do not place theosis first and primary. They are absorbed by the beautiful things of the world and lose sight of the eternal. They give themselves completely to secondary purposes and forget the one thing necessary. Particularly today, people are constantly occupied and we neglect our salvation for the sake of these everyday activities. Perhaps this is a scheme of the devil to delude even the chosen ones. For example, we now spend time learning, studying, reading. We have no time to pray, to go to church, or to confess and take Holy Communion. Tomorrow we will have meetings and conferences, personal and social obligations. How will we find time for God? The day after tomorrow, we will have weddings, family cares. It is impossible to engage in spiritual things. We, too, continually repeat to God, I cannot come. I ask you to have me excused. So, all the beautiful and legitimate things lose their value. All these things have real and substantial value when undertaken with the grace of God. For example, when we try to do everything for the glory of God, but only when we do not stop yearning and continue to pursue what is beyond studies, beyond profession, beyond family, beyond all the good and holy responsibilities and activities. Only when we continue to desire theosis as well, then all these find their real meaning in an eternal perspective. It is then that they are of benefit to us. The Lord said, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6.33 The kingdom of God is theosis. It is when we receive the grace of the All-Holy Spirit. When divine grace comes and reigns within man, that man is ruled by God, and through these deified men, the grace of God comes to other men and to society. But as the fathers teach in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come means the grace of the Holy Spirit come. When it arrives, it is this which deifies man. 2. Moralism Unfortunately, the spirit of moralism which we mentioned earlier, i.e., basing the Christian life on moral improvement, has adversely influenced the piety and spirituality of Christians to a significant degree even here in our land. We often cease to pursue theosis because of Western influences on our theology. Guidance that only aims for moral improvement is anthropocentric. It is centered on man, and in it, human effort dominates, and not the grace of God. It then seems as if it is our own morality that saves us, and not the grace of God. Life under these conditions does not give us genuine experiences of God. Therefore, the psyche is not truly satisfied because its thirst remains unquenched. This method of guidance has been tried, and it failed because it does not represent the genuine spirit of Christ's church. It is often responsible for atheism, and for many people's indifference towards the spiritual life, especially among the young. In our catechisms, sermons, and everything said by parents, teachers, clergy, and other workers of the church, instead of talking about sterile improvements of mankind, let us educate Christians towards theosis. This is the genuine spirit and experience of the church. Otherwise, the virtues, regardless of how great they may be, do not, in fact, fulfill the purpose of the Christian life. They are simply ways and means which prepare us to accept theosis, the grace of the Holy Spirit, as St. Seraphim of Sarov taught so clearly. 
3. Anthropocentric Humanism This self-sufficient humanism is a socio-philosophical system which is separated from and made independent of God. It leads contemporary man to a civilization based on selfishness, and this has brought modern humanity to an impasse. In the name of the development and liberation of humanity, it wishes to estrange us from our Orthodox Christian faith. But is there any greater development possible for man than theosis? Chapter 9 Consequences of Guidance for Theosis The guidance that our Orthodox Church offers, with the Holy Services, patristic theology, monasticism, is theanthropocentric guidance. Its center is the God-man Christ, and it leads to theosis. This brings great joy into our life when we know what a great destiny we have and what blessedness awaits us. To set our sights on theosis sweetens the pain in every trial and all the worries of life. When we are struggling towards the aim of theosis, that is to say, when we see one another as prospective gods, our attitude towards our fellow men changes for the better. How much deeper and more substantial will be the guidance which we will then give our children? In what a God-pleasing way a father and mother will then love and respect their children, feeling the responsibility and holy charge which they have towards them? How much will they then help them, by the grace of God, to attain theosis, the purpose for which they brought them into the world? And how will they naturally help them if they themselves are not oriented toward that purpose, towards theosis? How much more respect will we have for ourselves when we feel that we have been molded for this great purpose, when we are without the egotism and pride which opposes God? Certainly, the Holy Fathers and great theologians of the Church say that it is in this way, by overcoming our self-love and the anthropocentric philosophy of egotism, that we become real people, true men. Then we will meet God with reverence and love, but also meet our fellow man with respect and true dignity, not seeing him as a tool of pleasure and exploitation, but as an icon of God destined for theosis. As long as we are closed within ourselves, within our ego, we are individuals, but not persons. Once we exit from our closed individual existence and begin, in agreement with this guidance based on theosis, with the grace of God, but also with our own cooperation, to love, to offer ourselves all the more to Him and to our neighbor, we become true persons. This is to say that when our ego encounters the thou of God and the you of our brother, then we begin to find our lost self. For, within the communion of theosis, for which we were molded, we are able to open up, to communicate, to really enjoy one another, and not in a selfish way. This is the ethos of the Divine Liturgy, in which we learn to overcome the narrow, atomistic interest to which the devil, our sins, and our passions compel us, and instead learn to open up to a communion of sacrifice and love in Christ. An awareness of this great calling of His, i.e., of theosis, comforts and really completes man. The orthodox humanism of our Church is based on this great calling of man, and therefore develops all His powers to the extreme. What other form of humanism, however progressive and liberal it may appear, is as revolutionary as that of the Church, which is able to make man a god? Only the humanism of the Church reaches so high. Today especially, when so many attempt to deceive the people, and in particular the young, by projecting false humanisms which in effect maim man and do not complete him, the emphasis given in this guidance of the Church has great importance. Chapter 10 
consequences of guidance that does not lead to theosis. Today, young people seek experiences. They are not content with a materialistic life, nor with the rationalistic society that we, their elders, hand down to them. Our children, being icons of God, called to be gods, seek something beyond the logical forms of the materialistic philosophy and atheistic education we offer to them. They seek experiences of true life. And certainly, it is not sufficient for them to be told about God. They desire experience of Him, of His light, of His grace. Many of them search in vain, resorting to many cheap substitutes to find something outside or beyond logic because they do not know that the Church has both the ability to comfort them and the experience they thirst for. Others are led to Oriental mysticism such as yoga, yet others to occultism or Gnosticism, and finally, unfortunately, even to outright Satanism. Even in morality, they do not know any boundary, for morality, once severed from its essence and deprived of its purpose, which is to unite them with holy God, ends up by having absolutely no meaning. Then tragic phenomena such as anarchy and terrorism become commonplace, so that many young people give themselves to every type of extremism and violence against their fellow men. Deep down they wish to satisfy a dynamism which they have within themselves. This deep yearning of theirs is not fulfilled simply because they did not chance upon this guidance of theosis. The majority of young people, and not only the young, squander the precious time of their lives, as well as the powers which God gave them for the purpose of achieving theosis, in hunting for pleasure and carnal worship. Unfortunately, it is often with the tolerance of the state that these become their contemporary idols, their contemporary gods, thus causing great corrosion to their bodies and psyches. Living without any ideals whatsoever, others waste away in various purposelessness, vapid, and harmful occupations. Some feel pleasure in driving cars at excessive speeds on the roads, often with tragic results of injury and death. And others, again, after many explorations, surrender unconditionally to a demonic dependence on drugs, the new plague of our age. Finally, enough people, after a relatively short life full of failure and disappointment, consciously or unconsciously seek an end to the torment of their vain quest, unfortunately resorting to the extreme form of desperation, suicide. Not all the young people who resort to those irrational and tragic things are hooligans. They are young people, children of God, our children too, who, disappointed by the materialistic, self-seeking society which we bequeath to them, do not find that for which they were molded, the true, the eternal. We do not give it to them, and so they do not know it. They do not know the great purpose of man's life, theosis. Then, not finding peace in anything else, they resort in desperation to the forms which we have mentioned. Today, out of selfless love, many shepherds of our holy church, bishops, priests, spiritual fathers, and lay brothers, devote themselves daily to the guidance to our youth towards the aim of theosis. We are grateful to them for their sacrifice and offering, for this God-pleasing work of theirs, with which, by the grace of God, psyches for whom Christ died are saved and sanctified. Humbly, the Holy Mountain helps and assists in this great distress of the Church. The Garden of our Panagia, being a special place of sanctity and silence dedicated to God, savors the blessing of Theosis, lives communion with God, and has intense and vivid experience of His grace and His light, so that many of our fellow men, the majority of them young, benefit from and are strengthened and reborn in Christ by a pilgrimage to Mount Athos 
or by maintaining more specific connections with it. In this way, people enjoy God in their life and begin to understand what orthodoxy is, what Christian life is, what spiritual struggle is, and what joy and great meaning these things give to their existence. This is to say, they taste something of this great gift of God to man, theosis. Let all of us, shepherds of the church, theologians, catechists, not forget about guidance for theosis, by which the young people, with all who are humble, with the grace of God and with our daily struggle, the struggle of repentance and observance of His holy commandments, acquire the possibility of enjoying this blessing of God, this union with Him, to enjoy it very strongly in this life, but also to gain eternal happiness and blessedness. Let us continually thank the Holy Lord for the gift of theosis, which is a gift of His love. Let us reciprocate His love with our own love. The Lord wants and desires us to be deified. After all, for this purpose He became man and died upon the cross, so that He shines as the sun amidst suns, and God amidst gods. End of Theosis, The True Purpose of Human Life by Archimandrite George, Abbot of the Holy Monastery of St. Gregorios on Mount Athos. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.